Hello and welcome to the Human Odyssey podcast. This podcast offers you an opportunity to join my friend Skander and I, Jamie, on our journey for knowledge. Each episode we discuss and learn ideas directly from experts all across the globe. Ideas centred around the future of humanity, including topics of the environment, development and political organisation. For our very first episode, we will be talking to Sharon Burrow, the General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation. We'll be learning about her ideas about worker organisation, the just transition and the pandemic. Sharon, how are you doing today? Good afternoon. I'm very well. Good. So just a little introduction. The purpose of the show is to give or emphasise uh, the voice of experts like yourself and also for interested listeners who are aware and care about the climate crisis and the current state of the world to give them extra details straight from the experts themselves. We generally try to get a dialogue going because we're trying to put ourselves in the shoes of the listeners and in a way we really are in the same shoes as them because we're we're here to learn. So we will try to ask questions that we think would represent the introductory knowledge of our listeners. So we're really excited to have you on the show. There's so much we could talk about, but uh, first of all, how is it going generally? I hope the coronavirus hasn't impacted your life too much personally. Well, on a personal level, I've been extraordinarily lucky and indeed my family as well. But uh, for workers around the world, of course, the impact is devastating. Yeah. And we are seeing uh, the worst of our predictions come true that, uh, you know, now we see some of the re uh, or new spikes, actually uh, the majority emanating from um, workplaces and without proper health and safety in workplaces, then, uh, you know, this will continue to be the case. So that's clearly a major priority along with uh, the recovery and resilience measures to support uh, workers around the world and their families as we see the devastating Mm. social and economic consequence of what began as a health crisis. Perhaps a a good question we could draw from that, because as everyone listening will have had personal experience with the coronavirus, it's a general question, what is to you the importance of trade unions Well, trade unions, of course, represent the heart of democratic values and, uh, you know, our commitment to freedom of association, to building uh, union and collective uh, power in the face of a corporate world that has lost its way has been absolutely fundamental. But COVID-19 has absolutely demonstrated, of course, the the role of unions in... uh, defending the interests of working people. And we've seen real advances on the social contract, whether it was paid sick leave, whether it was uh, uh, wage uh, guarantees uh, and indeed uh, income support. Now vital because so many people fall out of direct employment. So if you consider the battles that uh, unions were already taking on, we were pre-COVID-19, living through an age of anger. The current economic model had generated a massive inequality, income inequality, racial injustice, gender discrimination. All of these systemic issues had not been dealt with to the point where increasingly people were simply excluded from decent work and a capacity to live with dignity. In addition to that, of course, we have a climate emergency, and this isn't... uh, despite uh, a lot of the, the uh, projections as much about the planet surviving as it is about the extinction of the human race. Because mm. once workers and their families uh, are indeed uh, um, extinct, then uh, the planet will run clean and green again. So we can't ignore either the employment imperative or the climate imperative. And yet, if you look at the state of the global labour market, it's uh, a tragedy of global governance, of a failed economic model. 60% of the world's workers now have no formal work. They don't have a direct employment contract. And that means they have no rights, no minimum wages, no rule of law, no social protection. So their capacity to face a situation like this is uh, pretty much... uh, you know, zero and none, because 
1.6 billion of the workers in that environment are already facing destitution. Now, it's not just an, a developing economy phenomena, it's actually all of the areas of our economies in developed countries as well that fall out of a direct employment environment. So even though we know of that 40% of workers, two thirds of them are in more and more precarious work from zero hours contract through to uh, casual short-term contracts, underpayments of wages and many other violations of labor rights. Mm -hmm. But we also have platform business uh, um, uh, growing, exploding in our, in our economies. We have freelancers, uh, so-called independent uh, contractors, many other people who are facing a world where there are no protections. That's informal work. And these businesses have been allowed to be informal businesses, not indeed taking responsibility for employment, but often not uh, paying tax as well. So if you had that kind of fragility before COVID-19 hit, and then we see the uh, consequences of underfunding in vital public services, health in this case, but it could be education, and certainly we've seen uh, that demonstrated in care, then you face a reality that our world is not resilient enough to handle global shocks when it means people are not protected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you, you mentioned the um, environment, and I guess that's, that's really at the crux of, of our show here. Um, just to go back on your, your history a little bit, your work history, you were ITUC president, is that right, from 2006, 2010? That's correct. And very much the, the first woman as well to have held um, many of the, the positions within these trade union confederations. Um, but you came from a teacher union background, is that, is that right? That's true. I started life as a teacher. In fact, I never meant not to be a teacher, really. I loved it. And uh, it was just that I was part of a teacher's union. And of course, the two um, passions for teachers, both, uh, you know, the industrial relations that guaranteed a commitment to smaller class sizes, to decent wages and conditions. Mm -hmm. And of course, the quality of teaching were two parts of a trade union as life in the teacher union. So my union offered me a chance to do some other work. And uh, I, uh, I, as I said, I never meant not to go back to uh, teaching, but the rest is history. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. of course, I was very privileged to be a leader in the trade union uh, movement for teachers nationally and internationally, but also then my own Australian council of trade unions. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder what, um, in regards to the environment, what you what kind of issues and, and maybe attitudes sort of that you've run into on the local national and international level as a representative of workers i wonder what kind of dynamics you've found through the years um, that people have towards environmental concerns so part of the difficulty has been that this is another um, example of failed governance from government through to international institutions. Because, you know, as early as the 1990s, of course, but I read my first IPCC report in 2000, and it was like reading a horror movie because, and they got worse from there on in. But that galvanises a trade unionist to say, well, if we need to shift the fundamentals in our economy to actually save the planet as a living planet where we can create and sustain good jobs, what needs to happen. But uh, too many governments have been in denial. And because we didn't ever have the kind of integrated planning capacity around the environment, around industry and jobs, then we saw the dominant interests of uh, those who benefited from a brown economy not actually wanting to shift the sands and dominating government policy again right around the world. Mm -hmm. So I won't pretend to you that the transition has or will be easy. We started a campaign in, um, well, way over a decade ago towards uh, the initial climate agreement hope, which was Copenhagen, around a just transition. 
because we've seen many industrial transitions and none of them have been very just. First of all, of course, workers and sustaining jobs and making sure they had skills to uh, assist in, in other areas of work where they were displaced, but also devastating uh, consequences for communities that were dependent on various industries. So this time we wanted it to be, and we still are determined that it will be very different. We won't leave people behind. We know that every sector of our economy has to transition. There's simply no argument about that. We have to get to net zero by 2050. We actually have to get 50% of the way at least by 2030 if we're to have hope of Yeah, every year that we cross cross and it, it gets worse and worse. The, yeah, the, the, exactly. the hill gets steeper, I'd say. Exactly. So we, uh, we absolutely demand transition in every sector, but with it comes the, uh, the demand for just transition. So that means social dialogue with workers at the table about how you transition, how you protect older workers with uh, secure pensions, how do you protect younger workers with uh, income support and skills to, uh, to actually uh, make the transition, whether it's in that industry or in others, and of course, support for redeployment. These are not difficult concepts, but they also come with community renewal and how you engage communities along with workers in what the future of those communities are. So one of our great hopes, of course, for coming through COVID-19 and indeed building recovery, but also resilience for the future, which is both climate and employment with social protection, is cities. Because if the majority of people are going to live in cities, then they have to be livable, they have to be sustainable, they have to have the social uh, basis of, uh, of jobs and indeed social protection. and the demand from the cities in key industries, whether it's agriculture or transport or services, will be fundamental to sustaining uh, other more rural communities or indeed communities around the world through, we would hope, a very serious reform of global trade. You, you said that for sure every single sector of the economy will have to be uh, reformed into a transition. Um, but do you think that people understand or or maybe underestimate how big of a, a transition is really required i mean we've had people on the show here who have taught us about the extractive policies and and, and ways in which um businesses kind of work off of extraction uh, in a way that's just entirely negative for the planet do you think that there are jobs that through this transition will be kind of completely erased in a way? There are jobs that are not necessary or mm. only detrimental to our planet? So let me quote an energy worker to you, a young energy worker in a community that's uh, dominated by a coal-fired power station. They understand that that coal-fired power station is not part of the future, but energy is part of the future. Mm -hmm. So... When um, that young worker said, well, we're not uh, coal-fired power station workers only, we're energy workers, yeah. and we want to be part of the transition, but we want to see that those jobs are good jobs, that they're union jobs, that we have a, a, uh, you know, a, a potential to help shape them, mm -hmm. and that they sustain our communities, then that's what you're talking about. You yeah. know, if you take heavy industry, it's not that steel will be extinct. It's that steel must be clean steel. And that is possible now with, uh, you know, breaking the threshold of not just uh, the high intensity that was generated only by fossil fuels now being replaced uh, and even uh, perhaps even cleaner in the future with uh, clean hydrogen or green hydrogen, as they call it. But uh, circularity, we're seeing cement uh, uh, companies out of India that not only has uh, halved its uh, emissions, its process emissions almost entirely, but is now talking about capturing both heat and carbon and reusing them in other products. So uh, things like soda ash, uh, organic fertilisers, um, carbon rods, which have the property of uh, and strength of steel. So, you know, there are companies leading the way 
there are mm -hmm. workers involved with those companies leading the way because we insist on support only where there's engagement with workers. And so that's the kind of industry policy we need as part of the future. I could give you examples in many other sectors, yeah, but yeah. Uh, you know, for us, there are no sectors that you can't actually transition to net zero. Right. But you need to yeah. actually build the plans and the pathways to get there. And so, yes, whether it's transport and electric, electric vehicles, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, broader transport areas like shipping, even aviation, mm -hmm. we can yeah. transition to a much cleaner base, but we actually need to build the plans, have workers involved in the just transition principles and make it happen. Mm -hmm. So would you say it's a question of there isn't really a sector that can't be clean, it's rather companies that need to to be cleaned. Absolutely. No, companies need to want to uh, be sustainable for the medium to long term. But if there, there's a report, uh, we had this argument, uh, you know, for years that industry, in fact, was marginal to the effort to get to net zero. We kept saying, no, that's not, that's not true. First of all, of course, it's an energy base, but beyond that, that's simply not true. And, uh, you know, while it's just a glimpse of what companies and uh, governments and workers are now involved in, nevertheless, the Mission Possible report that uh, indeed uh, grew out of, um, you know, a company, a community and, uh, and a and university-based uh, set of research shows that every sector, every industry sector can indeed uh, transition. But you have to have the will to do so. You have to have investment, of course, in the industry policy that makes it happen and in the enabling green infrastructure, such as energy, but also other sectors that make it possible. You spoke earlier about how the ITUC was, was campaigning and it just made me think of what do you see as the primary vehicle or process uh, through which the ITUC enacts change? So is that lobbying in the UN or is that conversing with national labor unions or? Well, all of that and much more. We have uh, uh, 207 million members around the world. They all belong to unions who are members of their national federation. So in the um, UK, that's a TUC. In Canada, it's a Canadian Labor Council. In, um, in Europe, there are many, many national federations, all part of a European trade union uh, Commission and globally, we represent all of those centres. So those uh, unions who make up those national centres bargain with their employers. And of course, they help lobby local politicians. The national centres lobby their, their politicians at the national level. And we engage uh, with them and through the international community as well. So you know, whether it's direct bargaining, whether it's actually creating the kind of understanding through education, sometimes through protest around uh, rights or climate or just transition or decent wages or, you know, at the moment we're saying that because of that environment uh, of anger and despair and the breakdown in the economic model for working people, we've demanded a new social contract. And that social contract we negotiated key elements of that last year in the ILO Centenary Declaration. So the International Labour Organisation is like a parliament of workers, employers and mm -hmm. governments, and it sets international standards or the rule of law globally. So when yeah. you talk about fundamental rights, it's freedom of association, the right to organise and bargain collectively, it's to be free of discrimination or child or forced labour, or occupational health and safety guarantees, they're all negotiated at the ILO. But when you put some of the other areas, you know, the elimination of violence uh, against women in the workplace um, and other workers in the workplace, or, you know, a fundamental transformative agenda for women or just transition and uh, for both climate and, uh, and green jobs, but also for um, uh, just uh, technology, all of these things come from an international discussion where nations bring their interests, workers bring their interests, and, and the employers bring their interests. So 
That ILO centenary declaration brought a lot of those things together. And with the sustainable development goals, of course, and the Paris Climate Agreement, we say that if those things were implemented, financed, then we would rebuild the social contract in large part. There would be national issues specifically, but we would rebuild a framework for a new social contract and give people hope and greater trust in democracy as well, because particularly for young people, and uh, you certainly represent that generation, <laughs> then trust in democracy is dying. So unless we rebuild the engagement of people, unless people see their voice matters to their governments, then we won't rebuild that. And if they don't yeah. see hope for the future, which we call just transition, then yeah, why I, would they? I agree. I think that's really key. And that's, I think that's a lot of what I, I've been studying. I mean, I'd like to ask from your experience, how do you think trade unions can, uh, can or can effectively be empowered? Do you think that political education, you know, knowledge and respect of democracy cultivated from an early age, do you think that's important? Well, as a teacher, of course I do. I yeah. mean, democracy is messy and, and it often isn't uh, producing what we want it to produce, but it's the best system we have. And we're seeing grow, growing authoritarianism, indeed the threat of uh, mm -hmm. the far right that uh, people are turning to in despair because they're very simple messages. But really, you know, it's about fascism and worst. And people, mm -hmm. uh, parents, grandparents fought world wars to actually uh, defeat you know, the fascism where people were simply uh, tools in somebody's, you know, kind of concept of power. So democracy is the best tool we have. So, of course, from an early age, the principles of democracy must be uh, instilled in our civic education. But for unions, you know, yes, of course, education always works. You would expect a teacher to say that, but it's true. But organising the power of workers is the, the key and, uh, and making sure that we represent the interests of all workers and, you know, include their interests in the things that we argue for, whether it's at the bargaining table, whether it's lobbying government, because if we don't uh, use the power that actually you get from collective organisation, and that's the foundation for unions, then you have no balance of power, whether it's indeed government and increasingly our authoritarian governments or whether it's an employer that is uh, exploiting or oppressing workers. So we know that without unions, the world would be indeed much weaker in mm. trying to defend and demand both democracy and rights. But it would also leave workers without voice that is uh, much bigger than an individual. Yeah, but how do we go over this hill then? I remember you saying about 60% of workers around the world aren't under any sort of contract. And, you know, I think about a lot of workplaces like um, in the US, for example, where unions are just not really allowed. Um, yeah. Union yeah. busting is very much a thing. So how do we get over these major, major hurdles where in a lot of countries, unions are either not allowed or workers aren't even under contracts. How, how, do we, how can we expand, effectively expand our sphere and quite quickly as well to make sure that this transition, which will indeed probably happen within the next 10 to 20 years, through the next 10 to 20 years and, and further on, how do we make sure that these people, these 40% of uncontracted people, but also the people who aren't in unions, um, how do we make sure they're, they're included? So, first of all, let me say on the US, then their industrial relations system is broken. You have uh, employers who, the, we say there's been a traditional battle between the European corporate model, which is all about profits and greed at any expense, and they see freedom of speech and freedom of association as being equal. So they hire anti-union uh, lawyers to fight mm -hmm. The, uh, the existence of unions, but they also uh, have a model where you have to have a ballot of unions in every enterprise, no matter how large or small it is. So they don't have the industry sectoral model that Europe has or indeed uh, the UK or Australia or others. 
So the battle between the European corporate model and the European, uh, the American corporate model, I'm sorry, and the European social model has been, uh, you know, a three or four decade long struggle. Mm. We say the social contract started to break down in the, seriously in the 80s with hyper-globalisation. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it was all based yeah. on a model that was exploitative supply chains. You walk those supply chains as I do and the the you know, the fact that workers are seen as less than human, the, you know, demeaning, inhuman way in which uh, employers approach the uh, the attitude to cheap labour and lack of conditions should be indeed, uh, you know, seen as the scourge of any economy. Now, there are ways to deal with that. So when you look at, again, come back to the ILO Centenary Declaration, because of that 60% and and indeed increasingly insecure work, even in the 40%, mm-hmm. then what the declaration said is that every worker is entitled to have a floor, a labour protection floor, we call it, which is fundamental rights, occupational health and safety, an adequate or evidence-based minimum wage on which you can live with dignity and maximum hours of work. Now, maximum hours of work in a digital workforce might be characterised slightly differently, but there's still a level of work that is covered by the very first convention, ILO Convention 1, which was eight hours work, eight hours uh, leisure and eight hours uh, recreate, um, recreate, sorry, leisure and rest. So, you know, whether it's eight hours or seven or six, you know, we will have to share work in the future. So working hours needs to be looked at, but then people have to have the right to disconnect. They have to have in a digital world, the right to be free of surveillance and privacy. So these are many things being played out now and debated, particularly within the European Union structure. Mm -hmm. In that context, you marry that with social protection, just transitions for climate and technology, and a transformative agenda for women with a tax base that funds our public services and our social protection for everybody. And then you create a very different world. And that's what we want to see. And that's what we'll fight for, in fact. We have three frontline um, uh, campaigns. One is rebuilding trust in democracy. And in order to do that, we need to build that new social contract. And then, because people need to have hope if they're gonna have trust, and governments need to engage in much broader approach than you know, simply uh, GDP, which represents mindless yep. wealth. It's not yep. shared prosperity. Yep. And, uh, and of course, then, uh, you know, uh, a, a climate and employment proofing our future. So we call that Kapow. And indeed, uh, you know, we know that there are solutions. So it's really a matter of saying, do we, um, you know, do we actually have a capacity to build not just the voice of organised labour, but the voice of communities, of young people, of women, to actually say that coming out of COVID-19, we want a very different world. We don't want a new normal. We don't want to build back. We actually want a world where prosperity is shared, where people are included, and where democracy gives people a proper voice with a rule of law that guarantees decent work through a new social contract. That's great. I've been thinking um, if we imagine a a world scene of isolated, atomized national labor unions, I'm wondering what you see the ITUC as having achieved specifically with relation to them, you know, connecting them or organizing them on on an international level. So, first of all, we are organising in the informal economy, Mm -hmm. in developed economies, and we're organising in platform business. You've seen, uh, you know, many of the workers organising themselves in, you know, some of those, uh, you know, Uber-type environments like Deliveroo and Uberisation or domestic workers or many of those those jobs which are indeed isolated or atomised. So, we're not frightened of actually organising workers in whatever the work environment is. And even, you know, despite the devastation, COVID-19 has given us an opportunity to focus much more closely on um, on workplaces by pivoting technology for organising. And uh, indeed, one of our um, 
most optimistic campaigns at the moment is the first vote in Somalia in 15 years. Uh, sorry, in 50 years. Universal wow. suffrage has been denied to the people of Somalia through amazing conflict and, you know, government authoritarian regimes. And they may get a chance. We absolutely think they'll get a chance to vote even as early as December. So, you know, um, let Somalia vote is a fantastic campaign being run in defence of democracy with, of course, a set of policy descriptions about how to build a better society and economy where everybody's included. So that's got to be organising online because with COVID-19, there'll be some offline organising in communities, but you have to build both. So in a way, it's not the fear of organising. It's what's the regulatory frame that governments will adopt. Will they continue to be cowed by corporate greed or will they adopt a regulatory framework to, for example, break up Amazon, stop the global monopoly and other big tech companies, you know, ensure that the rule of law for labour rights is in fact robust and covers all workers, put in place the promise that the uh, European Union has made to actually have the minimum wage on which people can live with bargaining, to support yeah. collective bargaining for shared prosperity and indeed to uh, mandate due diligence because if every company has to not just assess the risk of financial, uh, um, uh, you know, kind of disasters, but also the risk of um, labour and human rights uh, oppression, and they have to put in place grievance and effect remedy, then unions will do their job. So we know how to fix the, uh, the regulatory environment. The real question is, can we get governments with the political will to do that, just as we need them to have ambitious, uh, na nationally defined contributions around climate that have at their heart jobs and just transition? Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned a lot of uh, what you've written, that things like the youth strikes, the climate strikes, the um, sort of private investors and also cities and towns taking control of things, uh, all of these give you a lot of hope, you've said in some pieces that we've read from you. Is there, before we kind of close up, is there something that, that gives you hope today? You look at and think this is the future and it gives you hope. So, first of all, let me say it's been inspiring to see younger generations fighting for climate, but also for me really, really heartening to see them adding climate and economic justice together so that they want to yeah. shape a very different world. It's, it should be the case that every, every generation wants to create a better future. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky enough to be a very young activist, can I say, in the 1970s, but we thought we could change anything. You just had to have the power of people, the power of unions, the power of movements like the women's movement or the movement against anti-apartheid, and we could change the world. Well, of course, as I said, with hyper-globalisation in the 80s and the impact on the 90s, then people started to realise that the greed, the corporate greed of profit at any cost was thwarting that. But I do think what I get real um, hope from, first of all, I work, I'm very privileged to work for um, unions around the world where our members are on the front lines as human rights defenders, as labour rights defenders, as environmental defenders, even risking their lives, sadly, in too many countries because they believe in that better future. But I absolutely believe that this, you know, rebuilding, recovery, building resilience, creating a much different future will be the struggle of generations. And to see young people working with all of the rest of us, you know, to actually get out and say we want different democracies. We want democracies that listen to people. We want to see policies that are much broader than simply a focus on more and more GDP. We want to see shared prosperity. We want to see climate justice. And we want to see people in their communities at the heart of that with, of course, jobs that uh, give people both hope and opportunity for the future. 
Sharon Burrow, thank you so much for joining us on our Odyssey. And um, we hope to hear a lot more from you, from your organization and from unions everywhere. Honestly, I think we, I speak for Jamie and I when I say that you, your work and the work that organizations like yours do is absolutely necessary um, yeah. for just transition but, for workers everywhere. Personally, it's inspiring to hear from someone working with an organized international body resisting the current state of affairs economically. Well, thank, thank you very much you. for coming and thank on the you show. for your <laughs> commitment to decent values, to justice, to climate justice, but thank you for the passion that you'll take in terms of the quest of shaping a much more just future. That was an excerpt of the song Enemies by the band Egoism. Thank you for joining us on our Odyssey. We're open to suggestions, comments and questions, so if you want, please feel free to reach us at humanodysseythepodcast at gmail.com. We're also on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at the Human Odyssey Podcast. See you next time on our journey.